Peter Ferrara is on the line with us. He is the policy director of the Carlson Center for Public Policy, an attorney and the author of America's Ticking Bankruptcy Bomb, the website the org. Do I have that right, Peter? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, great. Welcome back to the program. Glad to be here. So, uh, in a way, didn't Mitt Romney, by saying that his job is to not worry or to, to basically not represent the 47% of Americans, about half of whom are on Social Security and so they pay no federal income taxes, and about half of whom are working at Walmart or working other jobs, working at Staples, and they make so little that they don't, they're not in the tax bracket where they pay income taxes. Um, didn't he basically say to them that they could just go screw themselves and, 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 and you know, abandon the whole pretense of Reaganomics and trickle-down economics? That, I mean, it used to be Reagan said to people like that, people who didn't have a lot of income, said, you know, we just need to you know, cut taxes for the billionaires and it'll trickle down. Don't worry, it'll fall off the edge of the table for you. That uh, 47% was the result of 30 years of, of Reaganomics because it was the result of Reagan and his Republicans cutting tax rates for what you define as the working class and for the middle class that produced that result. And so that is why, by 2009, uh, the bottom 40% of income earners were paying no income taxes and the middle 20% was paying only 2.7%. Well, you know what the numbers were in 2008, taxes. Peter. This is 2009. Right, I'm saying in 2008, you know what the numbers were before the Bush Depression happened. In 2007, the top, uh, the bottom 40% paid no federal income tax, and the middle yeah, it was 20% the, it was paid 4 it was Let the, me tell you, that, let me just finish the point. The middle right, 20% sure, paid 4.7% uh, in 2007, and by 2009, the middle 20% paid 2.9%. Okay. And so it was... 30 years of Reaganomics, they, uh, they, they cut the, ta- the tax rate, starting all the way with the earned income tax credit, which was originally Reagan's idea he, that came out of his testimony. Before passed by a Democratic Senate Congress. In 19, passed by Democratic Congress, yes, but it originally started before Russell Long Senate Finance Committee. Reagan testified. He proposed the earned income tax credit as a way of offsetting payroll taxes on poor people. For him, it was an alternative to welfare, eliminate taxes on the poor. And that started that, but then it continued uh, 30 years. Reagan cut the tax rate on everybody, including the lower-income people. He doubled the personal exemption, which benefits the lower-income people more. Uh, that ex- was extended with the child tax credit during the uh, Gingrich years. They, and Bush then made the child tax credit refundable. He cut the bottom rate by 33%. Uh, and so it was all these tax cuts during the Reagan years on the lower-income workers as well as the higher-income workers that resulted in the the bottom 47 percent not paying any income taxes at all and massive tri- ma- massive deficits supported over all those years and massive deficits but that that doesn't you know that, that may or may not be the case peter and we can slice and dice those things all day long um and and i'm perfectly willing to just not even dispute your numbers the point the point is that romney basically said my job is not to pay attention to that 47 percent who don't pay federal income tax now all of them who are working the ones who are retired may, maybe are not paying payroll taxes but all of them who are working even the ones working at staples or walmart they're paying the the federal payroll tax and they're paying state taxes and they're paying sales taxes and they're paying gasoline taxes but romney says not my job to care about those people don't you think that that's a fundamental problem or does that genuinely reflect how how you guys on the right view low-income people he said that politically that wasn't part of his strategy now that's a stupid strategy because the people in the bottom 47 percent want jobs they don't want welfare and so he should be pitching to the bottom 47 percent uh that uh, that he to create economic growth and prosperity so they can get jobs rising wages and rising income so it's a very stupid strategy and it was a, a, a stupid position. Now, notice that in his tax plan, he does not raise taxes on, the, on that bottom 47%. So that is positive. And also, um, the Republicans as, and the conservatives across the board uh, all support uh, the continuance and maintenance of, of safety nets. So that's not a dispute in the country. You're misleading people when you say that's part of the debate. Well, Paul Ryan, not. you know, I mean, George W. Bush in 2005 tried to convert Social Security into into a, a totally Wall Street-run program rather than a government-run program. He said that you know the, the, the yes. political capital yes. he got from having a war in Iraq was going to get him that. He said that back in 99. He did it. He tried. He'd, he failed. 
I'm the guy who worked with Paul Ryan to introduce a bill precisely to carry out the personal accounts for Social Security. In that bill, we kept the government guarantee that you would get at least the benefits promised by Social Security. So it maintained... If you were of a certain age. No, that was across the board, all ages. And that, in all the bills I work on, that, that's... And you have that in Chile, too. There's a continued a guaranteed benefit uh, for the personal accounts. So I've always advocated maintaining the Social Security safety net for the personal accounts. And Ryan's reforms all maintain Medicare, maintain Medicaid. In fact... How can you can maintain Social that- Security when you're turning trillions of dollars of the Social Security trust fund over to, uh, you know, uh, these, these hustlers on Wall Street? How can you maintain that? With the personal accounts, the standard long-term market that returns, they would get higher benefits, not lower benefits. So you just have so, to hope that you're one of those people who retires when the stock market is at a peak rather than a valley. No, because you still have the guarantee that, that you'll get at least what Social Security promised. You. So how can so you that, do that? It, it sounds like you're saying chicken and every pot. That, the reason you can do that is because you're, uh, everybody's going to end up most likely with much higher benefits. So, so people are paying more up, into it? No, because the returns are higher. When you actually a lifetime of savings investment will always give you more than a lifetime of no savings investment. So you're basing security. all of your math on this on the assumption that the stock market is always going to go up. Well, the stock market has always gone up over the long run, but the point is that you still have a social safety net in place no matter what. How can since, it, since, you since know? I have long advocated. Let me explain it this way: since I have long advocated that you are going to get much higher returns and benefits from savings and a lifetime of savings investment in these personal accounts. Then why don't I just go ahead and guarantee everybody that you'll get it? How do you account? How do you cover that third of Social Security recipients who didn't pay into it for a lifetime, who paid into it for maybe nothing? They were born with birth defects, or paid into it for three years and both their parents died in a car accident, or they paid into it for five years and in their twenties they broke their neck. How do you how do you account for that one third of Social Security recipients who are living on Social Security disability? Well, because you do, you have disability insurance as part of the personal accounts. That's what they have in Chile. See, all the benefits are covered. Well, the program uh, in Chile is blowing up, you know, Peter. It's, it's melting down. Up, it, no, no, it's not melting down. It's actually, Chile's becoming a first world country, and it's demonstrating to the world how to become a first world country. And fundamental to that is all the increased... And they're doing away with the private accounts. accounts. All the savings and investment from these personal accounts, which promotes economic growth and prosperity and helps to promote... Uh, Chile going becoming a first world country, which is what it's going to do, and so it's pro growth. It's pro they're, worker. They're abandoning the, the, the Chile yeah. has has abandoned their pro, their personal accounts, and they've gone back to government funded programs. Peter, no, you know this. That's, false. that's completely false. It's, it's a fairy tale, and it's it, it's pension fund socialism. Tom, you should be for this because the workers then own the, all the businesses. Through so these you want to force workers to give money to Wall no. Street. We're not forcing workers to do anything. It's an individual choice by each worker. So if if you don't pay into it, then you don't get that retirement. Well, you still get Social Security. Oh, so So, you want to force people to pay into Social Security? Yes, I will force people to pay into Social Security or the personal account. That is the policy. That, that, That was in the bill that we introduced in 2004 and 2005. I am increasingly baffled, but I'll leave it at that, Peter. It's one of the few times we haven't ended up shouting at each other. And I'm pleased to hear you say, you know, I, a lot of Republicans now are pointing out that, you know, Romney's statement was just really dumb because there's a lot of poor people who vote Republican. They don't know why, but they do. And you're right. Peter Ferrara, theccpp.org is the website. Thank you, Peter. All right. Thank you. Bye.